Hey everyone, today we're looking at self-hosting and how that old dusty computer in your closet can actually become useful again. So let's break down what self-hosting means. You can grab a computer from your closet, hook it up to the internet and start using open source alternatives that run on your computer at home. It really is just that simple and so much more complex at the same time. This also means that all the data stays within your reach. It won't be sold to a third party, you're in charge of everything, and it will be still usable on your end even if the software is sunsetted by the others. Coming back to open source software, this term is commonly used for software with source code available to the public, meaning anyone can use, modify, and share it, usually for free. There are some open source projects that I consider industry standards. If you've been following our channel, you've seen many of these in our MeshNet series. If not, check it out. When it comes to open source self-hosted services, my absolute top one is Home Assistant. I've been using it daily for a couple of years now. Once I ironed out a couple of kinks, it's been tirelessly managing my smart home devices with no rest for exactly 122 days and 20 hours. Now that you know what self-hosting is, let's talk about what you can actually do with it. We've covered a lot of open source self-hostable software in the past videos, but here are a few of my top picks. For media streaming apps, you have Jellyfin, which allows you to manage and stream libraries of videos, music, books, comics, and photos. It supports all modern platforms with multiple client applications for mobile and desktop devices. It's a media server for your personal media collection. If, instead of only movies and music, you'd like to manage all kinds of files, a good alternative to cloud service providers like iCloud or Google Drive is Nextcloud. It's a great solution solution that offers more than just file sharing. For creative teams, PenPod is a great application. It's a web-based designed and prototyping platform that should be familiar for those of you who used Figma. It allows developers and designers to collaborate on designs for websites or applications. And for those of you who are looking to automate your home with bells and whistles, like automatic blinds, lights, and multi-room speakers, the aforementioned Home Assistant is a good option. It rivals proprietary solutions like like Tuya Smart and provides endless possibilities for tying together different systems and devices. But the capabilities of self-hosting don't end there. You can also self-host game servers for games like Team Fortress 2, Valheim, and Palworld. And if you have a beefy enough server, you can even run a heavily modded Minecraft server like I do with over 200 mods. Thanks to modern containerization solutions, which we'll cover in upcoming videos, you can set up your self-hosting server on pretty much any modern operating system. While the community for Linux-based systems seems to be the biggest, thanks to things like Podman or Docker, you can set up your server on Windows without a problem. My personal choice for a self-hosting server operating system is Ubuntu. Thanks to its big community support and general friendliness when it comes to managing web-based services. However, starting your own server if you're unfamiliar with Linux can be challenging. So if you're more familiar with Windows, I suggest sticking with it. And if you like to think different, you can even run your server on an Apple device. Mac OS is a Unix-based system that works great with self-hosting, although your options to expand might be a little limited. We look deeper into hardware in a future video, but here is a sneak peek. One of the best things about self-hosting is that you don't need to break the bank. Got an old computer lying around? Nothing beats free, but if it has at least an 8th generation Intel CPU or equivalent, you're good to go. Another great option is a mini PC, a NUC, a second-hand terminal PC, or a single-board computer. Speaking of single-board computers, I'm a huge fan of Raspberry Pis because they're generally great for embedded projects, thanks to the GPIO pins. However, for the price of a new board, you can get a device with a little more oomph when it comes to self-hosting. Last but not least, you can consider a VPS, which stands for Virtual Private Server and can be rented for a couple of bucks a month. We talked about them in our first video about setting up MeshNet on a VPS to create your own VPN connection. Let's discuss what it's like to self-host. First, it requires time. Starting to host apps on your own is pretty easy, but it's not something you master overnight. It takes time and effort. 
it is also extremely satisfying. Nothing beats the feeling when your server starts for the first time and everything just works as it should, or when other people start actually using the service you're hosting. Additionally, self-hosting can actually save you money in the long run, especially if you replace paid services with their self-hosted alternatives. This depends greatly on the upfront cost of your server and the cost of running it, which is mostly tied to the electricity cost in your location. Last but not least, it can be frustrating, especially if you're not keeping up with your backups. Sometimes configurations get overwritten by mistake. Sometimes things work differently than you expect. Sometimes you receive faulty hardware. As with any hobby, always expect the unexpected and whenever self-hosting starts to feel like a chore, take a break and return to it in a day or two. I want to take this opportunity to show you my personal setup and how it evolved over the years. Here is a picture of my first home lab server. It consisted of a hand-me-down Intel Atom based mini PC, a Raspberry Pi 4B and a couple of Iron Wolf HDDs. I mainly run two services on it, Nextcloud to manage pictures and videos and Home Assistant to manage smart home devices in my apartment. Here is where I learned a couple of hard life lessons like why backups are important or why hard drives and wireless communication protocols don't like each other. Notice how I kept a water bottle next to it in case it spontaneously combusted. At some point, I decided to build myself a proper setup and opted for a small form factor built based on the ASRock X300 mini chassis and Ryzen 5600G APU. I used two sticks of RAM totaling 32GB and added a couple of drives, with the addition of NordVPN to secure my outgoing connections and mesh them to access all my self-hosted services, it's exactly what I needed. I'm currently lacking disk space and looking to upgrade my storage in the near future. The self-hosting community seems to share the sentiment that there is never enough storage space. And that's it for this video. I hope that now you have a decent idea of what it means to self-host and what your options are to get started. Keep in mind that especially when you're starting out, you don't need a custom-built server or enterprise gear. An old laptop or a Raspberry Pi will be just as good. If you found this video interesting, make sure to drop a like and subscribe for the upcoming videos. We'll talk in detail about the hardware and guide you for your first home server build.